Jira with Gruel Adventures. Let's have a look at their opening hands. <laughs> That's a lot of lands. <laughs> Kenji, that one is going straight back. This one looking a little bit better. Fire Prophecy, Ghost Fan Dragon, and Edgel Innkeeper. Having a look at what Ishimura is working with Double Charming Prince, Heartless Act, and Binding the Old Gods. Yeah, I think as a limited player, Kenji is very much used to playing against the Shepherd of the Cosmos, Port of Carfell <laughs> combo in Cal Time Limited, but perhaps a little bit puzzled as to how to attack this four color Garuda deck from Ishimura here. Is do you want the fire prophecy do you bottom it and keep four lands it, what is the right call here from igashira <laughs> well <laughs> maybe that's one of the advantages of bringing something so out there so left field into a tournament like this even though it's a you know a limited field a smaller meta game surprising everybody and putting them on the wrong foot from the get-go can be very valuable yeah, and this is not something that's new for Shintaro Ishimura. Ishimura has always, in his entire history of being a magic online grinder, being a professional magic player, he likes to go his own way. He doesn't like to play what everyone is playing. He's not really conforming to conventional wisdom. And some of the coolest decks I've ever seen in magic online just putting up great results have the name Riser attached to them, and for good reason. He's just an incredible player. There's that port of Carthel, <laughs> the uh, uncommon land from Kaldheim, the one that's uh, the blue black one, I believe, the one that's able to bring um, creatures back from the graveyard. Yeah, for, for those that don't actually know what Port of Carfell does, it does come into play tapped as a blue land, and it has a six mana activation plus a tap to sacrifice and return, mill four cards, then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Right, so a little bit of a slower combo maybe with the Shepherd of Cosmos that you were talking about, but it is a combo, and there is the namesake of the deck, Guy Runa, Doom of Death's Drawn. There's uh, multiple copies, of course, in the main deck, as well as the one in the Companion Zone. And, you know, Money, we, we saw Guy Runa make some waves, as it were, in the first couple of weeks of Ikoria Standard when it was first released. Um, and is, is this deck kind of building on those older versions that we saw a, a year or so ago? Not particularly. Those decks were strict ramp back when the companion rule was what it was originally. You were just trying to cast the Garuda in your sideboard as fast as possible. Turn four if you could, turn five on a bad day. And the entire goal was just comp continue cloning Garuda, continue copying it, blinking it with Thassa and Charming Prince, and trying to just mill your opponent out on the spot if you could, or create an insane board state. That's not really what this deck is doing. This is just recognizing that Garuda as a card has value as a card advantage and board position engine, and it may be a good avenue of attacking these aggressive and more mid-rangey decks like Adventures. All right, as we just get this overlay fixed up for you, you see Garuda there happily on the screen. And um, that one, when it comes in, is going to do some milling, is going to do some <laughs> flipping cards onto the table. <laughs> exactly what we want to see <laughs> right now. As we see Kenji Igashira with just the 1 1 token left out on the battlefield, he could have actually chosen to play out the Brushfire Elemental last turn, but decided not to, Marnie. Yeah, I think just trying to make sure that he hits the fifth land drop for the Ghost Fan Dragon. That that seems to be a common theme for both players here, as now Ishimura is playing the Charming Prince, just trying to scry a sixth land on top to ensure he gets to play Garuda next turn. And you actually see him not foretell the Shepherd of the Cosmos in order to leave a Heartless Act for exactly this card that Igashir has here, the Ghost Fan Dragon. Ghost Fan Dragon hits the battlefield. But... Ishimura does have the answer. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's time. Oh, is it Garuda time? It, it, is, it is Garuda time. All right. You don't bring four color Garuda to League Weekend to not, to not Garuda. cast Garuda. <laughs> All right, here we go. Mill four from each player. Let's see what the hits are. Looks like it's just going to be a scavenging ooze. Yeah, the other option was a mass vandal. All right, let's have a look at 
the sideboards of these players. Marnie, in your expert opinion, what should Ichimura with his four-color Gairuda deck specifically bring in for the Gruul Adventures? More removal, two glass caskets, two extinction events, all going to be quite relevant in this matchup when you're going to have the better mid game. Garuda is, as we just saw, a pretty insane uh, presence on the board. So Ishimura not worried about the mid game. It's all about survival. So those glass caskets, those extinction events will go a long way. Maybe interested in another copy of Mass Vandal, as that is a nice, clean answer to cards like the Great Henge and Ember Cleave, assuming you don't die, uh, which, you know, your entire deck is trying not to do, but does already have a copy of Mass Vandal, so may opt against it. Uh, there's an argument to be made for another copy of Dranith Magistrate, just because of the adventure creatures, but typically that's a card you're more interested in for a ma matchup like Soltai Ultimatum. Um, all right, so... We are just having um, a think about how to fix the situation because we do know that everyone at home, we didn't miss it, but everyone at home missed the end of that last game. You do see that the game counter updated there for you. Ishimura did, in fact, close out the end of game number one. So we... Uh, Let's just go back to the end of that last game and just show everybody how it played out because I think oh, I we would. won't want to miss. I, don't, I think we won't want to miss uh, a minute, a second of this awesome deck on your screen. So let's just go back a little bit with the magic of television. <laughs> and we can see here's Shatter Skull Smashing for Kenji taking down those two uh, smaller creatures there on Ishimura's side. But Ishimura is going to come in with Gairuda. That takes Kenji down to 12. And then Shepherd of the Cosmos is going to be joining the battlefield. That is going to return the Charming Prince, which of course can then <laughs> flicker the Shepherd of the Cosmos again. And this is just exactly what the deck is designed to do, Money. Yeah, I, I love this idea of we've seen it with the Charming Prince and Yorian combo in the past, but essentially hiding the Garuda for a turn. Lots relevant in this matchup, uh, but this is something that can very much come up when you're playing a deck that's packing a card like Extinction Event. You want your even creatures to not all be on the side of the board, and Garuda <laughs> will come back on your opponent's end step and create a board again if you need it. Yeah, and Kenji Igashira with just a lonesome Brushfire Elemental in hand does not see a way out of the vortex of value that Ishimura created, and that is how we ended up in game number one. All right, we've already talked about sideboards, so let's just go straight down into the second game here between these two very popular figures. Let's see what's going on. Oh, this one not so good for Ishimura. Only has the one land available, but the other cards look sweet. Yeah, every other card is great in this hand, but one lander not good enough. Uh, you do see those two extinction events and two glass caskets coming in. That is very much the type of card that Ishimura is looking to find here uh, in this second game, especially on the draw. You do see him taking out two copies of Port of Carfell, actually, as, it, you know, a matchup like Gruel Adventures isn't where you really need the full grinding value of that combo, and you don't always have the time to implement it, so it makes sense to take out it, some of the copies of the card that essentially cost seven mana to activate. Yes, you were actually thinking quite hard about what to put back here. The Charming Prince would be a turn two play, but he actually has the Wolf Willowhaven in hand, which may be a better card in terms of ramping up to the four drops. So that's why he's really thinking about whether to put this Charming Prince back or not. Yeah, I think from Ishimura, he's looking at his curve and saying, well, on turn three, I'm either going to be able to play... Uh, Binding the Old Gods or put Garuda in my hand. After I do that what is going to be my next few turns? Am I going to be able to get Thassa down and then try to go for that Thassa Garuda combo that we saw in the old Garuda decks? And I think this makes a lot of sense. You lead off with a tap land, Wolf Will Haven on two, binding on three, and that means your turn four can be put Garuda in hand plus Charming Prince, try to scry and maybe ensure you have that six land or six mm -hmm. mana source like we saw Ishimura do last game as well. 
looking over at Kenji Igashira's hand. He's going to lead off on the Fabled Passage, despite having all of these landfall creatures in the hand. Why would you do? Uh, why would you sequence in your lands like this, Money? Uh, I think it's just a matter of trying to get the Kazandu Mammoth down on turn three. Uh, if you lead off with the Edgewell Innkeeper into the Brushfire Elemental, you don't have that luxury. You see the uh, unfortunate nod of the head <laughs> from Kenji as he draws the third untapped land anyways, and suddenly the Fabled Passage that looks so good with a Brushfire Elemental in Kazandu Mammoth has already been used up. Yeah, we have seen some very turboed out Great Henges as well, thanks to the combination between Fabled Passage and Kazandu Mammoth. But now that the Fabled Passage has gone away, Igashira is going to have to rely on one landfall trigger per turn for now. Does get a nice in hit in taking Ishimura down to 16. But Ishimura has that binding that we were talking about in his opening hand. That's going to take care of the mammoth. Ooh, Ooh another Fabled Passage, though. Th that's massive. I was about to say, I Igashira was suffering because without that Fabled Passage, he couldn't make Brushfire Elemental a five-power creature to cast Great Henge this turn. But right on time, he draws another copy, and you see Ishimura preparing himself for what would be <laughs> the quote-unquote nuts here, and that's what it is, is just being able to get down that Great Henge on turn four has the edge while Innkeeper follow-up, that can completely change the tide of this game. And Ishimura does not find any more action, just a bright climb pathway off the top. Dranith Magistrate is an interesting choice in this particular uh, matchup. Like, it stops the adventure creatures, but doesn't have a lot of the utility that you would think about against something like a showdown of the scores or an emergent ultimatum strategy. Okay, this is the last draw for Igashira. If he finds something like a Fabled Passage, uh, he will be able to put together the last two points of damage that he needs. No <gasps> double red for that. Oh, so unfortunate. Finds the Ember Cleave, but is not able to finish it up this turn because of the lack of double red. Still, though, Igashira in a commanding position here, opponent at two life, three lethal threats on board as well as an ember cleave. Yishimura does have the mana available for the Gairuda. <laughs> He's okay. gonna go for it. He he has to. Okay. Is he there can anything that he can Shepherd. Shepherd gets back an untapped land. Uh, which he does have a fabled passage. Untapped okay. land lets him cast Charming Prince and do it again. Oh okay. my goodness. We have some redraws. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's let's not move over to, yet. Let's move to Ishimura's view. Okay. <laughs> Shepherd of the Cosmos gets back the Fabled Passage. Let's find an untapped land. Uh, the the Endatha Triumph is going to allow Charming Prince to be cast anyway. So getting the island is fine here. Charming Prince, that's going to be able to flicker uh, the Gairuda. Gairuda right. come back in the end step. Igashira still has an Ember Cleave. Yes, but Thassa I believe Thassa does it. that doesn't do anything. Oh my goodness! Okay, so there's three blockers to the three attackers here, and it does just seem like the Ember Cleave on whatever is blocking or whatever creature the Charming Prince is blocking will potentially be lethal. Incorrect. Yeah. Wrong here, money. So close. It was close, but as with many dreams before this one, Ember Cleave is here to be the fun police. Oh, that, that fabled passage changed this entire game for Kenji Gashira. Even then, it was so close. <laughs> you know, even then, if Ishimura had flipped something different or did something different that then maybe it could have turned the other way but Igashira takes down game number two with Ember Cleave and before we let everyone find out who wins this one we are going to go to a few quick messages stay tuned
Welcome back, my friends. We are in the middle of this very spicy and very awesome matchup between Four Color Guy Ruda in the hands of Shintaro Ishimura and Gruel Adventures in the hands of Kenji Igashiro, otherwise known as Numa the Nami. Going into game number three, Money, are uh, either player looking to change anything up? Uh, it looks like Ishimura changes slightly. Uh, we did see that coming into the second game, he had taken out two copies of Port of Carfell uh, and had brought in two copies of Extinction Event. It looks like for the third game when he's on the play, he's not interested in that. He's looking for more explosiveness, a bit more disruption, perhaps, and just trying to make sure that he can enact his game plan while still having a few pieces of removal. Looking at what Kenji is doing, looks like a Chrome War is coming back in, maybe thinking to try and steal a victory here by uh, snatching away a Garuda or a Shepherd of the Cosmos. I'm excited to find out what's ha gonna happen. The viewers are excited to find out, so let's go down to the action. And opening hands for both players look reasonable. Shintaro Ishimura with a Wolf of Lohaven, nice bit of ramp on turn number two, Thassa, Garuda, and Mask Vandal. Kenji, on the other hand, Brushfire Elemental, that's his two drop, a couple of copies of Lovestruck Beast as well to back it up. Yeah, Ishimur doesn't have an untapped second land yet. There it is, uh, right on time. So he, he he didn't actually have a nice piece of ram on turn two, but uh, fortunately for him, off the top means that he can play this Wolf Will Haven on turn two and then potentially lead off from there if he would like. Though, considering he didn't have an optimal turn three play anyways, it makes sense if he just continues playing tapped and trying to uh, play a more measured pace. All right. Measured pace, however, is not what this Gruel deck wants to be doing. So Brushfire Elemental is going to come down and poke in for a hasty one damage. Ishimura finds the Binding of the Old Gods, which would have been a great turn three play if uh, if he had the turn two ramp and an untapped source. But is going to be able to double spell anyway this turn with Wolf Willow Haven and the Mass Vandal just coming down as a blocker. Kenji continues tutoring up Fabled Passages right on time <laughs> as he needs them. But this isn't that bad for Ishimura. He has that Mass Vandal available as a blocker for the 1-1, so saving some life. And if Mass Vandal goes to the graveyard, not the biggest deal, considering Garuda can uh, try to at least put together a combination of ways to get back a Shepherd of the Cosmos that can then get back Mass Vandal. So Binding the Old Gods is going to come down. That's going to take down the biggest threat on the other side of the battlefield, the 5-5 five -five Lovestruck Beast. Scavenging Ooze for Igashira. And a lot of these cards that Kenji's drawing just seem to be kind of annoying for Ishimura to deal with. Yeah, I think the biggest annoyance right now for Ishimura and what he's really sweating is there's no sixth land yet for him. He's going to get a tapped sixth land from the Binding of the Old Gods second chapter, but what he's really looking for is just to play that Garuda next turn. That may end up being the deciding factor between winning and losing this game. Taking a guaranteed five damage from this Brushfire Elemental here is going to be quite painful, but there's no Ember Cleave. The Clothis does pose some compounding pressure, but he has ways around that. It's just really going to come down to, can I get Garuda down in time? So Igashira is going to play it a little bit slower, not going for the Fabled Passage this turn, content to just get in for three. Is it an untapped land? No, it's a Shepherd of the Cosmos off the top for Ishimura, and that makes things very awkward indeed. Yeah, Shepherd is a card that can be messed with using Scavenging Ooze. Garuda, not, it cannot just because all of the resolution of the ability happens at once, so you don't really have a window to uh, interact with it using Scavenging Ooze. Uh, so this is a turn where Igashira, Ishimura may want to just put a second copy of Garuda uh, into his hand or just try to uh, foretell Shepard, plus potentially Heartless Act. You do want to get rid of that Scavenging Ooze if you can, or just leave it up as an answer to this brush file elemental as it is quite annoying right now the damage that is poking through your mass vandal and there's only one creature in graveyards right now we believe the love struck beast that is in uh, igashira's graveyard so 
if Igashiro goes to activate that scavenging ooze, Ishimura can, of course, use the Heartless Act to take it out in response. But as soon as the counter is put on it, the Heartless Act can only remove that counter and not deal with the creature itself. So we'll see what Ishimura decides to do with uh, the resources available. It does go for that line that you were talking about, putting the second copy of Garuda in hand. Yeah, the Heartless Act on the Ooze in response. The Ooze does have enough mana to activate again, so Ishimura not walking into that potential trap from Kenji. Uh, instead, just saving the Heartless Act for either this Brush for her Elemental, which is uh, presenting five damage here, or this Goldspan Dragon that just came off the top. But, you know, this is really rough now. You see Ishimura pausing here. Do I play around the Great Henge? Do I kill this Brushfire Elemental in response to this mm -hmm. Fabled Passage crack? Do I expose myself to a potential Goldspan Dragon? There's awkwardness in each line that he chooses to take here. Yeah, really got to think about the exact composition of your opponent's deck here as well. Playing around the Great Henge, you know, there's only two copies of those. There's also only two copies of the Dragon, so really up to you to decide what kind of threat you want to play around in this case Ishimura picked the uh the one that was not incoming and you can see his reaction there to Goldsman Dragon coming down now he does have a blocker on the ground so this isn't going to be lethal just yet just five damage coming through, potentially able to rebuild with Garuda actually keeping his mass vandal around here there is a copy of the Akroa while waiting in hand for Kenji as well. So let's see what Ishimura can do here now. You can see him kind of hoping and praying. Here's Gairuda. He didn't come here not to cast Gairuda Tomb of Deaths. What are we going to find? It's Just a brush, brush fire, fire elemental. elemental? from the opponent. Uh, Garuda, wow. of course, it, it can what hit from either player's miss. graveyard. Yeah, but really what you wanted was to find a Charming Prince out of your own thing, get the engine going again. Just finding a Brushfire Elemental, there's a Goldspan Dragon in the air. And a Clothis as well could provide some burn if Igashira needs to, but this one looking very good now for Kenji Igashira. Yeah, Kenji has the mana to work with to essentially kind of do everything that he's looking for here. He could accrue and war the Brushfire Elemental to have it as another attacker, potentially, if he so wanted. He could play Clothis plus Lovestruck Piece. He could do it all if he wanted to. Something that he may want to be wary of uh, is not letting his Devotion get to 7. If he turns this Clothis into a creature, it may give... Ishimura an opportunity to glass casket it, for example, mm -hmm. whereas as long as it's on the battlefield and not a creature, uh, you're essentially representing an inevitable source of damage to close out the last one point that you need there. So it looks like it's going to be a Kroon War on Gairuda, which interestingly enough, <laughs> lets Ishimura play the second copy of Gairuda without worrying about, you know, killing one on his own side of the battlefield. Clothis is going to be the follow-up here. And Ishimura just left with that single masked vandal finds a fabled passage. Now, is there a sequence of uh, Gairuda shenanigans here that can get him out of this? Not really. Unfortunately, a large part of the Gairuda chain involves Shepherd of the Cosmos, and as long as that scavenging goes is on the battlefield and there's three mana available to Ishimura thanks to that Goldspan Dragon, there, there isn't really anything uh, that makes this happen. Ishimura does have the ability to... Um, blink his mass vandal with that Thassa, get rid of the Akron War, and get his uh, Garuda back, but that still doesn't present an, no creatures in the yard, so it doesn't even actually have the ability to do that, but it still doesn't uh, answer the Goldspan Dragon or the Clothus on the battlefield, so it, it looks like this is just the end of uh, the game for Shintaro Shimura, just putting up 
a little bit of effort as this is the last match of standard here and wanting to get a few more turns in with his uh, four color Garuda, uh, which is more or less a pet deck. But unfortunately, it is Kenji and Gishira who's going to take the win with his Gruel Adventures deck here. Yeah, you see the GGs being offered there by Shintaro Ishimura. Nothing wrong with milking your feature match, though, for the last few minutes. And there we see it. <laughs> Kenji showing off a little bit of uh, a little bit of swag there on camera. We love to see the emotions. We love to see the reactions coming from our players over player camps. Really makes these online tournaments, you know, have a little bit of that feeling of live in-person play when we get to see the way that they cry or cheer or laugh or show off their their much. So. Um, yeah, I love great... to see a little Saitama there on the screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> love to see um, a lovely conclusion to uh, our standard rounds today. But even though it's the last round of standard for those two, it is not the last match of standard we are going to see this afternoon. We are moving from one innovative Japanese deck builder to another. After the break, we are going to have Ken Yukihiro going up against Rei Sato. And Ken Yukihiro, the sole uh, pilot of Is It Tempo this weekend? Yeah, no other players on this deck, but Ken Yukihiro, much like Shintaro Shimura, known for playing the decks that he likes to play, playing decks that no one else is playing, and a lot of the times he wins with them. All right, well, stay tuned to find out whether Ken Yukihiro can do it again with Is It Tempo just after this. What's up, my friends? My name is Hayo, and I'm here with Mani Davudi. We are bringing you coverage of the April Strixhaven League weekend. A lot at stake for all of our players this weekend as we uh, look at our second feature match in our last round of Standard for the weekend. It is Ken Yukihiro, um, the Japanese pro, going up against another Japanese pro, Rei Sato. And both of these players on 2-0 and oh in their pod right now. I believe, Marnie, that Ray, if he wins this, has a chance of moving up a pod for Historic later on. Yeah, it, it is going to depend on 
some other results in pod one. I believe specifically Reed Duke's match is going to be the primary decider. But Ray does have his own fate in his hands. He's a player that started out very strong in the MPL this year, uh, was at the near the top of the standings at the very beginning of the Zeneca Rising split. Uh, we just saw him this weekend uh, move down from the first pod into the second for day two. So really wants to make his way back there and try to secure that spot in pod one, at least for the second league weekend. All right, let's have a quick glance at the deck list here. And uh, Ken Yukihiro on Is It Tempo? This is the the kind of um, standout one that we are looking at this round because Kenny Kihiro, the only person to bring is at Tempo. And these lists have gone through a little bit of a, shall we say, evolution since um, since they were first popularized a few months ago. Yeah, this is this is not your grandfather's is a tempo. This is this is not the deck that we are used to seeing. This is not the gold span dragon pile that was really popular at the very beginning of Cal Time Standard. This is cycling without cycling. We we are seeing go for blood, improbable lies, naturalized. This many people don't know this, but drawing a second card in a turn was actually a theme. It was a strategy, an archetype in Throne of Eldraine. And we see Fairy Vandal making an appearance Fairy in this deck. Fairy Vandal. Ken is very much <laughs> trying to draw a second Ken card. Ken has gone deep. I mean, a few things to pick up there about what you said, Marty. When you say this isn't your grandfather's Is It Tempo deck and you're referring to a deck that was popularized by uh, by Louis Scott Vargas himself, I think there's some implications there about about LSV that you know you may not want to be uh, you may want to be a bit careful there about a very popular um, figure in in Magic's community. Second of all, when you say this is cycling without cycling, there are a lot of cycling cards here, Manny. I, I, I guess what I'm more specifically trying to say is. Zenith Flare and the cards that really care about cycling, like Dranus Singer and the Flourishing Fox, those are not the cards that this deck is going for. The cycling cards, you're casting them a decent amount of the time. Having Go for Blood as a fight spell is a viable option, even though primarily it is still triggering your Iron Crag Pyromancer, your Riel, your Fairy Vandal, your Improbable Alliance. They are castable cards in this deck. I'm extremely excited and happy to see the uh, four mana to fairy to fairy master of time being played in this deck. He saw a little bit of play in some of the kind of soul time mid rangey lists when he first came out, but hasn't really found a home in standard since then. And just the, the idea of a planeswalker can, that can uh, act that can be activated at instant speed on each turn is pretty exciting. Let's have a look over at what Ken Yukihiro is going up against with this Is It deck. It is Ray Sato on cycling, and this is cycling with the cycling money. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, if that's cycling without cycling, this is cycling with cycling. Uh, we already saw Ray on the cycling deck just put up a really impressive performance against Jean Emmanuel Dupra last round, and we're now seeing him try to go for the 3 0. That is. It, it it's what he's really aiming for is getting back into pod one. It, it's so important to be in a pool with players that have similar or better records than you, as that gives you the most opportunity to propel yourself ahead. All right. Well, let's head down to the action. It's going to be sparks flying in this one. Can you hear it? Keeping that hand straight away has an improbable alliance in it, as well as uh, three one mana cyclers and an iron crag pyromancer. Ray Sato also has a very nice hand. Flourishing Fox as well as Improbable Alliance and some cyclists of his own Zenith Fair to top it up. Yeah, if, if I had to pick a nicer start, I would certainly give it to Ray. Having turn one Fox is extremely terrifying, though. It, it looks like wow. this is... This is the power of Improbable Alliance right here. The, it is not very often that you see a cycling deck forego playing a Flourishing Fox on turn one. And the only reason for Ray to do that is recognizing I need this Improbable Alliance down, likely because my opponent's Improbable Alliance will blank my Fox forever anyways, <laughs> and I just need to keep up in the token game. Okay, well, so it's Improbable Alliance is facing off against each other in the early turns of this matchup. 
Ken Yuki Hero, though, has the follow up Iron Crag Pyromancer, and that is going to be setting up some extremely explosive uh, triggers as soon as any cards are cycled when he untaps. Yeah, it, it's funny because Ray can't really play a Valiant Rescuer anymore. Dranith Singer as a creature. Ooh, that. <gasps> oh, <laughs> what about a second Improbable Alliance? Okay, so we have one fairy plus three damage facing off against two fairies per cycle. Ken Yuki Hero does get to untap first and make the most use of it. But, you know, both of these players running predominantly blue-red decks, not a lot of enchantment um, interaction for either of them. This one's going to be interesting we are just going to come back to the booth very shortly as we try and get the stream quality uh judged up a little bit for all of you uh, Marnie, i'm so excited to see what happens i i literally cannot tell what is going to happen at all uh, from this point out I, i'm very worried that what this game is going to be is a lot of two ships passing in the night where both players are just going to be cycling their cars drawing cards and just throwing maybe some spells at each other while the fairy tokens just sit on the board staring at each other like you know peons in an army while the generals are just like having a discussion they're just standing around doing nothing i i feel like that may be what this game comes down to <laughs> just like various fairies throwing themselves at each other well you know Ray Sato does have the two copies of Improbable Alliance down, so that is double the fairies for him, assuming he can keep the train of cards going. And, and, and you see Yukihiro recognize the importance of that as the first Iron Crag Pyromancer trigger actually got aimed at a creature. You would think that maybe for Yukihiro, he would be prioritizing sending damage face to try to close out this game, considering he can't break through with creatures. But in his position, perhaps he's just saying that I, I may not be able to burn him out because of the existence of Zenith Flare. So I need to keep the board in check until I can find different avenue of attack. Yeah, Zenith Flare, the gain life mode on that, usually not very relevant because a lot of the time when, you, when you're casting it or you're casting two Zenith Flares in a row, you are just winning the game. But in this case, with Pyromancers bolting you in, you know, potentially every turn or every other turn, that life gain could be very important indeed. We are going to see the first of those go at face. Ray Sato down to 17. <laughs> Here we go. Here are some fairies being thrown against each other. And this is something we're going to see happen a lot, we think, as we yep. go through the, the course of this game. The dust settles and here we are again. <laughs> Here, a Frost Veil Ambush, that's, that one's getting cycled away now. Oh, Fairy Vandal, the Ken Yuka hero. It's so interesting because this Fairy Vandal can get, you know, much bigger. It can get plus one, plus one counters put on it. Um, but what's it going to do when it gets just gets chump block every turn? Yeah, that that is the big question for Ken Yukihiro. Is oh my how, goodness. How do you deal with the sheer token generation that Ray Sato is presenting thanks to the now three copies of Improbable Alliance? Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, you know what? I've changed my mind. My money's on Ray now <laughs> for this game. Three improbable alliances. We saw that do so much work already in the feature match area. This card really uh, one of the kind of slightly unsung heroes, I think, of this standard format. We're seeing we are seeing it have such an impact here on every matchup that it's been resolved in. And Ray Sato about to have three copies, making three fairies a turn. It, improbable alliance may have started as an unsung hero when we first approach the standard format, but I think at this point, everybody recognizes this is the most, or maybe second most after Zenith Flare, important card in this cycling deck. It's what allows it to really keep up with these creature decks and be able to present a board state that suddenly flips the switch from defensive to offensive. Right, well, here we go. <laughs> Three fairies pass. Ray very much enjoying his triples here. Three fairies, three Zenith flares. Three is the magic number, of course. 
can you hear it coming in with a 2-3 fairy vandal? And, you know, even though this feels somewhat fruitless because they, they are just going to get chumped away, you still have to make these attacks because otherwise those fairies are just going to get completely out of control. Okay, that that's not bad. A second? I <laughs> cried Pyromancer for Ken. What if Ken draws a third one and we have a triple Pyromancer facing off against triple alliance? I think the triple alliance would lose pretty quickly in that board. This is an interesting decision for Ken. If you play a Pyromancer, you're opening the door for Ray to use the Zenith Flare while you're tapped out. But at the same time, if Ray doesn't have a Zenith Flare yet, uh, wishful thinking from Ken Yukihiro, then... Mm -hmm suddenly this game is over because you do have that neutralize available next turn. So, is Ray forced to just take out one of these pyromancers? Seems Absolutely. like the answer is yes. <laughs> so, Ironcrag Pyromancer number two does go down. We're back with just the one copy Ooh. for Ken Yukihiro. Finds Boon of the Wishgiver and could, in fact, just draw four cards right now if he wanted to. I, I want to draw four. I, I want to draw four so badly. <laughs> Okay, Marnie, keep your request to yourself. No, no. It, it, oh, yeah. it's, this game is so interesting. Just It's so interesting. <laughs> All right, so if Ken draws four here, that does leave the door open for uh, Ray to essentially just do whatever he wants next time. It, it, it does, and I think that is what is interesting about this game is Ray, let's say he fires a Zenith Flare at that Ironcrag Pyromancer. That's two Zenith Flares gone, and Ken has had free reign to develop as he wishes. Now, mm. that's starting to get dangerous because this is open deckless. Ray knows how many counter spells Ken has available to him. Ken knows that at this point in the game, the only thing he needs to counter is Zenith Flare. So that Neutralize will just get left up for the remainder of the game to counter Zenith Flares. And suddenly, as long as Ken can find more copies of Improbable Eyes to keep up with Ray's token making, I don't know if Ray can win the game, and it'll be determined many, many, many turns in advance. This is so interesting, Mani, because as you say, now Ken is untapped, has that Neutralize up for at least one of the copies of Zenith Flare, Ray still has to deal with that Pyromancer on the battlefield at some point. And, but Ray has this insane engine going with the Improbable Alliance. Like, there's certainly a world where Ray can end up making three tokens per turn. It, it, it certainly is. Uh, we have already seen it happen twice now, and I think uh, Ken will take this end step once Ray has tapped out to make sure he draws his second card for this turn. Likely with that go for blood, though, Fire Prophecy is also an option there uh, in order to just get all of his triggers and make sure that he's not giving up any value. Right, so it is go for blood that gets cycled away. Ken being careful, leaving up that neutralize. And, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, okay. That's all four. <laughs> that all is this... all four. I mean, and you see that tick of that on Zenith where 10 cycling cards in the graveyard. Each of those is hitting for 10, gaining 10 life if they resolve. This game is wild, are you? Uh, <laughs> so... And Ray also does have this pressure up going with the swarm of fairy tokens. You know, Ken's fairies, they go tall, right? They, they're getting counters on them. You know, he does have that one improbable alliance to keep, the, um, keep some of these forces at bay. But ultimately, he's trying to build up a couple of big flyers right now. And Ray can just at some point, reach the point where he has so many tokens that he can set up some kind of sequence where he hits for a bunch in the air and then tries to string together a couple of Zenith Flares through some counter magic. Yeah, that that is the plan for Ray, absolutely. But at the moment, he doesn't feel like he has uh, the board state to do that. He does have two more cyclers in hand, the Stinger and the Rogren Triumph. So that's three more tokens coming out this turn. And I think for Ray, the big goal is make sure every single one of these Zenith Flares is lethal. All right. 
Teferi, Master of Time for Ken Yukihiro. Ray, going to do some cycling in response. Now, does Teferi change the maths at all here? Not particularly. It, it, it may help Ken find another neutralize, but uh, for Ray, if he wanted to fire off a Zenith Flare on that end step, he would have to forego making three tokens, and by not doing so, it means that Ken has a decent window now to try to find another hard counter. He does need three, and he needs them pretty quickly. There are a full four neutralizes in the deck, so... There's oh, there is one! There's one! So he needs one more hard counter to be able to really, you know, just stop Ray Sato in his tracks. Ray does not have enough mana yet to be able to think about firing off two of these in one turn. So even though Ken only has four mana up, which is only leaving up one copy of Neutralize, uh, that is going to, you know, be sufficient at least for this turn cycle. And Hayu Teferi is the card in this is a tempo deck from Kenya Hero Hero. He's playing a full three copies. And the reason it's so insane is because it gives you a guaranteed draw each turn for no mana investment. So now mm -hmm. on Ray Sato's turn, Ken actually has two draws to trigger the Iron Crack Power Master, the Fairy Vandals, and the Improbable Lions and still leave up neutralized thanks to go for the blood cycling for one and to fairy giving you a free activation so ken's deck is fully online and ray sato is at eight life his first two zenith flares mm -hmm. are going to get countered and he doesn't currently have the eighth untapped land to go double zenith flare on the next turn so this is really scary for ray in a game where he kind of had everything he did have hit three triple alliances. He had a flourishing fox, which he ended up cycling away in the end. But you know, he had he had the fox on turn one. He had he's drawn all four copies of Zenith Flare, putting himself in this insane position that most you know most games you would want to see yourself in this position if you're the cycling player. But Ken Yukihiro currently the man with all the answers. I haven't seen this many fairies on the battlefield since Bitter Blossom was standard legal. How you? <laughs> I mean, that is 10 on the side of Ray Sato and uh, two, two baby ones and two big ones for Ken Yuka Hero. Wow, We're this... about to be joined by three more. All right, that, that's the eighth land. So okay. now Ray has the option, and by option, I mean very much the necessity of going Zenith Flare this on. Ken's next turn, and then trying to double Zenith Flare the turn after. So is Ray attacking here? I I think he kind of has to. He can't allow Teferi to remain on the battlefield. It, it looks tempting to try to go face, but at least some of these fairies need to be pressuring Teferi. This is so awkward. He has to pressure Teferi, has to get Yukihiro within range of the Zenith Flares as well, and he has a lot of fairies to work with. But that's a tall ask when you're faced with three blockers in the air, potentially more. You don't know, obviously, um, whether Ken Yukiro has, you know, another one mana cycle or a cycle in hand. But you can assume that that's uh, what he's been holding up. There's an Iron Cramp High Manta as well. Yeah, so, so part of the fear here for Ray is if he attacks with too many, Ken will just go, okay. I'll block it with my Fairy Vandal, the rest get through, I don't need to worry about it. And then potentially he's able to put together a lethal attack back. If he mm -hmm. attacks with the number he just did, well, Teferi activation, three blocks, and Iron Crack Pyromancer will leave Teferi at one. So, un unfortunately for Ray, a and there's actually a fourth blocker as well, thanks to Improbable Alliance. So, Ray attacking with this many won't get rid of Teferi. It will just get rid of a few fairy tokens on Ken Yukihiro's side. So, before damage happens, we saw Teferi activate, and we're going to see this go for Blood Cycle. So, that's going to be the two cards needed and you see those triggers go on the stack now iron crag pyromancer that's going to be able to target either face or a fairy presumably let's see whether ken yukihiro is actually interested in keeping teferi around at this point 
I, I would guess he very much is, considering if he sends this face and counters the first Zenith Flare, he will actually present with an Archon Pyromancer activation on his turn and another on Ray's next turn. That's lethal, and all he needs to do is counter those Zenith Flares. So I think he'll likely want to go face and still be able to protect Teferi at one loyalty with the four blockers he has. Okay, so... It is indeed going to face and eight. You... Ray has a startling development as well. It, so he oh may actually goodness. use this on an unblocked fairy while still leaving <laughs> up Zenith Flare to try to kill off Teferi if he really prioritizes getting rid of the Planeswalker. Uh, apparently not. I think he prioritizes the cycling ability of it maybe a little bit more at this point with the three improbable alliances on the battlefield so teferi lives through that combat step despite this absolute swarm of fairy tokens coming his way and you know that is something we are used to seeing from teferi just eternally clinging on there stomp. as can you can stomp? do a stomp wait is that lethal that's lethal ken has oh, wait, a counter okay. for the zenith player that's lethal. oh my goodness stomp uh, okay, Ironcrag Pyromancer does three to the face. Ray Sart is sitting on Zenitha for 14, but we know Ken Yukihiro has two neutralizers in hand and Bone Crusher Giant off the top. All he has to do is not let the Zenith Flare resolve. Yeah, he can pass the turn. Ray has to act first. He can respond to this with the Stomp and doesn't even have to counter the Zenith Flare for that to be game. There wow. it is! Bone Crusher Giant stomp to face. <laughs> and who would have thought that Ray Sato, after resolving three improbable alliances and making a literal billion fairy tokens, is gonna lose that one to burn to the face? Can you hero going up again with Is It Tempo? Oh boy, am I glad we decided to show this one. <laughs> wow. Oh, what a game. I... That that was a game, and that was just game one. <laughs> yes, yeah, strap yourselves in, folks. There's more to come. Uh, I think, Manny, we, we're going to actually take a little breather to, to let that soak in for everybody. Just, the, you know, the nutrients of what we just saw sinking in. And uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Uh, don't go anywhere. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Hayyan. I'm here with Marnie Davudi. And, uh, oof, 
we're still recovering here in the booth from that scorcher of a game one between Ken Yukihiro and Rei Sato. Uh, Mani, let's not talk about sideboarding. Let's just go straight in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to see more cycling action. Ads. Like, Let's go down. Oh, I do see Ray Sato has actually sided out a copy of Zenithala. That's That could change the uh, the calculations for us, even though Ken, of course, doesn't know that that's what's going on. Yeah, Ray boarded out one Zenith flare. Ken one-upped him with boarding out two neutralizes. So <laughs> both players really just taking out some of the play and counterplay available to them. All right, Ray Sato with the Improbable Lions on turn number two. Are, are they both just playing Is a Temple round? <laughs> is a Temple now? <laughs> what is happening? No, there's a Valiant Rescuer. So uh, Ray Sato living up to the Jeskai part of his deck name. Ken Yukihiro looks like uh, does have the Iron Crag Pyromancer as well as Teferi Master of Time. So it's going to be able to set up that sweet little combo in short order. Yeah, Ray is ready post board though. Red Cap melee times two, ready to take out those Pyromancers at no cost to him save one mana. And one mana cycler, Ray needs to find a third land though. There it is. All right. Okay. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Red Cap melee taking down the big threat on the side of the battlefield for Ken Yukihiro. This one looking a little bit more one sided than the previous one, although we kind of thought the previous one looked a bit one-sided when Ray Sato resolved the third copy of Improbable Alliance as well. Let's see how Yukihiro deals with this. It is going to be Teferi. Yeah, I am not here to count out Ken Yukihiro for winning any game of Magic ever. I'm with you there, Mani. So very Master of Time goes digging. There's a copy of Neutralize. Does not have the mana to leave that up this turn. Interestingly enough, Ken does have to put the shields down in terms of that red cap melee for a potential pyromancer, but he does still have access to Teferi Master of Time. So if uh, Ray plays an Iron Crag pyromancer and goes for a cycle, Ken can respond by phasing out the pyromancer. If uh, Ray plays Iron Crack Power Master and passes the turn. Uh, Ken may actually have to forego activating Teferi on Ray's turn here in order to make sure that he can protect his very fairy vandal from an Iron Crack Power Master here. Hmm. Interesting considerations all around. So it looks like Ray's going to lead off with both fairies at Teferi. <laughs> Teferi, get it? Okay. I, oh, I got it. <laughs> Ray thinking about the startling choosing. development. Oh, that's a nice one. And we've seen we've seen players really think about casting this card quite a few times. You know, there are some cards in the deck that are clearly just there just to be the one mana cycles. But this one, you know, does have some utility here and there. Ray started thinking about putting some mana into that. The size against it. Yeah, there were arguments to using it on either of your fairies there. Try to get rid of this fairy vandal or try to get rid of this Teferi or at least knock it down a bit. But here we go. And I, I think for Kenya Kihiro, do you care about your fairy vandal or your Teferi? And uh, it looks like he's actually giving the option mm -hmm. to uh, Ray Sada to get rid of this fairy vandal. Uh, decides to target the fairy vandal, <laughs> puts the oops on the stack. And I can't tell if that's a BM oops or if it's an actually I made a mistake oops here from Ray Sato. Wonder what everyone at home thinks. Was that a BM or was that oops I should have targeted something else. Let's go back over to Ken Yukihira's turn. He finds a negate off the top. There's a couple of options available. No fifth land just yet. Goes digging, but does not find it. And looks like it's tit for tat here as Red Cap Melee takes down Ray's copy of Iron Crag <laughs> Pyromancer. Although, uh, <laughs> fear not if you're a fan of the Pyromancer because <laughs> she's back. This game is 
wild. Fortunately for Ken, he does now have the ability with that startling development and Teferi to put another counter on the Fairy Vandal here in case Ray goes for a Pyromancer plus activation. Uh, that will mean that he's not able to block a Fairy token with the Fairy Vandal if he wants to keep it alive. So there's so much consideration from both players here about what to play around and really just to make sure that they're leveraging their cards and getting the most value out of them. Such an interesting matchup and really not one that either player would have thought too much about coming into this. I mean, it, cycling, is just guy cycling maybe a little bit more of a known quantity, but Can You Hear Us Is It Tempo deck certainly would not have been on, on many players' radars coming into this league weekend. I, I think if you told people Can You Hear or was playing Is It Tempo, this specific build would still not be on people's <laughs> radars until you right. showed them a deck. They would have a very different <laughs> snow database in mind when you tell them Ken Yukihiro is playing as a tempo. Well, snow time to dawdle for ten Ken Yukihiro as uh, Teferi goes ticking up once again. Ray Sato does get to resolve this Pyromancer, is going to be able to bolt something. Are you really going to take the risk of targeting the Fairy Vandal? I feel like Ray Surely should not. know that this deck is full of one-mana cyclers and go after Teferi. Instead, he acknowledges the one-mana. Is it worth the risk is what he's thinking about right now. I mean, it would just be so... All right, well, the target has been locked. And there it is, starting development, cycled away. That's going to put a counter on this three damage. Uh, is going to be able to stop the Fairy Vandal from, you know, eating one of these uh, tokens, but the Fairy Vandal survives as a 3-4. And notably, that wasn't a surprise for Sato. It was not a, oh, I made a mistake. That was acknowledgement of him recognizing that is something that could happen should he go for this play, and just forcing Ken to have it anyways. This was a calculated risk and really just trying to make the most of his cards. So Ken decides to get his own copy of Iron Crag Pyromancer down, put another counter on the Fairy Vandal. <laughs> All right, and now we're in the thick of it with both players, you know, a little bit kind of what you were saying earlier, Mani, about ships passing in the night. That they're, they're not passing without seeing each other, but maybe just, you know, pinging each other with a few little cannonballs here and there, but... <laughs> not a lot of structural damage done by either player just yet. Yeah, there's cannonballs being fired. The damage is mostly cosmetic, you know, no major load-bearing columns or anything being taken out. I'm interested to see how far we can stretch this analogy as we go into the <laughs> next couple of turns. It's going to be three fairy tokens at a fairy who is currently at two, of course. He can take up at instant speed. Ray going for this red cap melee will be faced with a negate. Ooh. Red cap melee targeting Iron Crack Pyromancer in response to Teferi, so as to minimize the chances of getting, you know, bolted this time. But Ken Yukihiro does have the negate. There's no counter back in Sato's hand. Which means that once again. To fairy master of time is currently going to survive, and this to fairy has just stuck around <laughs> turn after turn. I wonder if Ray Sato is going to really regret that decision earlier on not to try and take to fairy out. I have said it before. I'll say it again. I want to draw four cards. You know, Mani, I'm totally with you this time. You convinced me. <laughs> Let's see four new cards. Oh, they are quite nice as well. A second copy of Iron Crack Pyromancer and a negate for that Zenith there in Ray Sato's hand. Those are four very good cards. Teferi can keep digging as well. And this Fairy Vandal is a large blocker, though, oh my god. Goodness, oh that's my goodness! Second Iron Crack Pyromancer for Ray Sato. Ken Yukihira is tapped out. No answers this turn to the double threat here, and lightning bolts are going to be flying everywhere. Boon of the Wish Giver, that's getting cycled away. Goodbye to Fairy. Three at face. 
instant decision making from Ray there, not even considering sending both at the Iron Cry Pyromancer from Ken, saying, I have Pyromancer Supremacy here, I'm going to make you act. Well, talking of Iron Crag Pyromancer Supremacy, <laughs> we do have the second one from Yukihiro hitting the battlefield. Little nod of acknowledgement there from Rei Sato. I believe this is three Pyromancers for each player now, considering a Pyromancer has been red cap meleeed on each side already. This is just like the, the Fire Mage Training Academy. You know, as we look forward to Strixhaven, maybe this is just one of those classes that you, <laughs> you should steer clear of. <laughs> what about a third Improbable Alliance, money? It didn't it... help Ray Sato win game one, but maybe it will help him here. Yeah, this is... <laughs> I, I, I've seen this movie before, is how I'm feeling right now. And it resolves. Can you care she decides not to negate that? Yeah, I, I think that negate is now being saved exclusively for Zenith Flares. Ken knows that he has two Pyromancers in play. He can fight through those Improbable Alliances. He has a large Fairy Vandal. He's going to have his own Alliance next turn. And what really matters at this point is just making sure that he doesn't get Zenith Flared out of the game. All right, well, Bolt is going to face. <laughs> that takes Yuki Hero down to 13. Fairies take him down to 10. Zenith Baron Han Fasato is at nine, so <laughs> what about another Teferi? I, I'm in the market for another Teferi. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Teferi Master of Time. Once again, for Ken Yukihiro. Goes digging Han immediately. Hand the one mana cycler. Wow. My goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay, so Iron Crag Pyromancer is down on Sato's side of the battlefield. And we're once again in this dance of Pyromancer versus Improbable Alliance. Also a 7 8 Fairy Vandal. Yeah, <laughs> By the way, and... my, my two drop is now a 7 8. And this is going to maybe give Ray some pause now as potentially Ken can set up a situation where between activations on Ray's turn and activations on his own turn, he'll be able to just activate Pyromancer both turns and just clear off blockers just to force this Fairy Vandal through. Mm. Well, he'd have to clear off a, a lot of blockers. Off. A lot. I, like, I'm not gonna, you know, put my nose out there and say exactly how many, but it's a no, lot. No, no, that would be too risky. That would definitely be too risky. I don't think my integrity would be able to handle a, a misstep at this point. Let's see, Teferi Master of Time go drawing cards again. That's going to be the first draw of the turn cycle for Ken Yukihiro. Cycling the Gopher Blood, that is the second one. Two bolts presumably hitting these oh tokens. <laughs> Riel now for Ken. Oh, <laughs> you know there are reals available to both players in hand, but Ken working with a lot more mana than Ray is. Yeah, and playing a real into an Iron Knight Pyromancer on board not the most appealing ask here. As yes, Ray will recoup his one card now, considering those Pyromancers have already activated for the turn. But the real will be leaving the battlefield on Ray's turn, on Ken's turn. Yeah, that real, the ever wise. Three mana O3 does get plus one plus O for each instant and sorcery in the graveyard, as well as that static ability, which is so powerful each time you discard a card, you draw a card, meaning that every cycle provides two cards. And Real Mirror now online. Ken's Real a little bit bigger than Ray's. She's a 10 3 for Ken. Yeah, once again, Ken having to make the choice, do I play this Improbable Alliance or not? Uh, playing it here would mean that he has to forego activating Pyromancers on Ray's turn, but in terms of the number of fairy tokens that he's able to answer that way, it should end up being the same either way as he does get an extra blocker out of it. Uh, does he draw two cards from Riel anyway? Oh, he does, of course. Oh, Riel... <laughs> 
Oh, <laughs> Riel and Teferi Master of Time with two Ironclad Pyromancers means that you don't have to put any mana into cycling cards. You can just activate Teferi every single turn, draw your two cards thanks to Riel's uh, passive ability, <laughs> and Bob's your uncle. And of course that means Ray also has three more fairies coming on the sense step. <laughs> because why not? Okay, so we are going to see some sparks fly here as um, <laughs> the very master of time <laughs> is going to activate. That's going to mean uh, the triggers coming off the pyromancers targeting the opposing Rial for uh, on Ray Satter's side of the battlefield. In response, Ray is going to make use of that ability and uh, make a bunch of tokens of his own. So currently, as the board stands, it is seven fairy tokens for Ray Sato going up against um, a motley crew of is it creatures for Ken Yuka Hero, all of which do incredibly busted things. Red Ray Cat has... Melee was fined. Yeah, so Ray has the option of if Ken goes for an activation of Teferi, responding with Red Cat Melee either on Riel or Iron Crack Pyromancer. Doing it on Riel will mean that none of the uh, draw two cards cards from uh, Yukihiro will uh, activate this turn. That may bait Ken into trying to negate this red cap melee, and if Ken goes for that, then that would allow uh, Ray to just send a Zenith Flare to the face uh, with that River Glide pathway post-combat. Oh my goodness. Alright, so red cap melee pointing at Rial. Is Ken going to take the bait here? We saw him leave up that negate before he does not take the bait. Let's Rial go. Does have the going negate to one. still. It's going to go to one from these tokens, but one, as we know very well, is not zero. Oh my God. <laughs> 10 minutes versus 11 minutes on the clock for both players. And Can you hear going to one from this attack? Ray will have to put down Zenith Flare if he wants to activate Improbable Alliance this turn. And if he doesn't, there are lethal outs for Ken Yukihiro. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are... Right, he doesn't the have Iron blockers. That's a 9-10 Fairy Vandal and 6 damage from Pyromancers alone. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's Ken oh, no. Yukihiro. Ken's thinking about fire prophecy. No, it doesn't go for it. Okay. <laughs> oh okay. My God. Ken is the one. Ray decides to go for the fairies instead of uh, the Zenifer, we think. So try him getting cycled. <laughs> that is, is going it? to mean there are nine lethal attackers okay. for Ray Sato. So fire prophecy gets rid of one fairy, pumps your fairy vandal up to 10. Iron Crag Pyromancers get rid of the other two fairies. That's coming through. Oh, it's actually going to be a cycle. To oh, man. Oh, my goodness. That's an improbable alliance. Okay. <laughs> okay. So two tokens down. This is currently 11 damage in the air, plus six from Pyromancers. I... This is so close. I think Ken had it. I. Okay, so... So if, if Ken had sent one of those Pyromancer triggers to the face and instead uses Teferi here to phase out this fairy token from Ray, he would have been able to have two more Pyromancer triggers and be able to have lethal this turn. Obviously, there's three cards in Ray's hand, so this isn't perfectly known information. This isn't something that Ken necessarily could have known as a guarantee. Ray could have two more cycles, but it is Ken beating two more cycles and a whole lot more tokens at one life anyways. Right, let's see let's just see what Ken's gonna make of this. He's played out two more improbable alliances. That's gonna be three more tokens. So he gets That's rid of two tokens here. Is he getting rid of okay, so there's still a fairy vandal. I mean that's He, he has, has five blockers. I think he lives. What is happening? <laughs> well, he still has to leave up that negate 
don't forget. He, he yeah. Does. Okay. So this is this is what you're saying, Lani. He's instead going to not die. Yeah. Right? Five attackers, to... five blockers. No He's cycling card for Iron Cripe. I don't remember. believe that you have two one mana cyclers in my end step. Not going to attack. Can't risk it. That's okay. a three mana Wait, cycler. What about Pyromancer cycle? Teferi can phase the Pyromancer out in response oh before you draw the card. Oh my goodness. And, and because that's a three mana cycler, Ray won't be able to leave up Zenith Flare if he goes for that. He could go for the three mana cycler and Zenith Flare. Right. So what Ray can do is play the untapped land, play Pyromancer, pass. If Ken activates Teferi, Ray can respond by cycling and trying to kill Ken. If okay. Ken sniffs this out and doesn't activate Teferi, things get a whole lot more complicated for Ray. Wait, do you mean with the Pyromancer down? Yes. Okay. Oh my goodness. This is wild. And Fire Prophecy, as a reminder, does not kill Ironcrack Pyromancer. Fire, Fire Prophecy is three mana, uh, three damage, rather. But it does give you a second draw. So as soon as Ray goes for this Rogrin Triome, if he goes for it, oh. that, that gives you the go-ahead, as you know, that Ray cannot send a Zenith Flare at your face anymore. Right, because... And then you can actually use the triggers from your own Ironcrack Pyromancers to take out this Pyromancer, the fourth Pyromancer, let's remind oh our viewers, God. with it on the stack. Ray can't cycle here. He no, he, he can't cycle. Oh my goodness! No, he's gonna do it. Okay, so <laughs> Ray puts the cycle on the sack, and now we're gonna see Ken respond with a lot of actions. He just phases it out. Oh my god! Okay. There's no activation. There's no activation. No trigger. We there are gonna be three more tokens. So that is still an issue for Ken. The eight lethal attackers. But the re Ray started passing the turn. So there's an interesting thing here where you see Ken not going for Teferi Plus to try to draw two cards and activate the Pyromancer. The reason for that is because in order for him to draw another card off of Fire Prophecy, he would have to forego his negate. And as we've very clearly seen from Ken Yukihiro, he is holding on to that negate for dear life. For dear life. Well, quite right. It is literally for his life. I mean, Ray Sato maybe has some hope if he can string together multiple Zenithers. Is this the first one we've seen this game? <laughs> he cited one out. not the attackers you're looking for, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's just going to be the Fairy Randall coming in. That takes out one token on the other side. Only seven one ones for Ray Sato going up against seven one ones for Ken Yukihiro. All right. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, okay, so you see Ken using this on Ray's upkeep because Ray hasn't drawn his first card for the turn yet. So oh, in, or goodness. in order for Ray to be able to activate this Pyromancer, he has to go double cycling effect on his upkeep. And that would mean the Zenith Flare would once again re get removed from the equation. Wait, but Ken, you can hear it can draw two cards right now. Ken Yukihiro can draw two cards right now with Teferi and still leave up Negate. That's the beauty oh, of this. He's this fully forcing stunning. Ray's hand. This Ken Yukihiro just stunning. master oh. class of the game. Oh, also just finds a red cap melee, by the way. <laughs> Unnecessary. <laughs> Didn't need it. Never worried. Got that one. I mean, it looks like it. Because <laughs> you're missing out on triggers if you discard the the Try oh, well, I guess not. I'm coming out because there's the fire prophecy starts come. Okay. No, he does realize that if he uses the red cap melee, fire prophecy drawing would require him to put down the negate. Once again, never okay. happening. Never, never ever ever. Okay, okay. Wait. Wait. Is wait right? Ken. Ken. Uh oh. Oh, he's cycling it. Wait, nope. That. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Sure. Uh. Okay. So. Wait, what is okay. happening here? It, Ken did fine. not put his negate back. Ken has negate. He just doesn't have an activation for... Uh, he doesn't have an activation of uh, the Pyromancers this turn. 
Okay, that's fine. So now we see the second card drawn, which was actually Ray Sartre's draw step because of that cycle. <laughs> Thinking about that Zenith flare, which by the way is doing 14 times Ken Yukihira's life total. This is just an is absolutely wild game. One magic. card left in Yukihira's hand. He thinks, what are the chances that it's a negate? But we know that Yuki Hero has been holding on to this counter spell since turn a million years ago. That is taking care of the Zenith Flare. And Ken Yuki Hero survives at one yet again. Hi, you win the game or draw 25 cards? Mm, draw 25. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, it. you don't have to choose because drawing 25 is great for Ken Yuki Hero at this moment. That very vandal is becoming a 13 14. Ken now, can attack with the... all his flyers now if he wanted. That's. I don't know whether that's true. I it, not it saying technically it, yes. I literally don't know. That is <laughs> game action. Um, Ray Sato is going to just keep making the tokens. Now this is like a war of attrition between the triple alliance on one side and the triple alliance on the other side. Ray Sato and finding a couple more lands, which would have been good for him earlier on in this epic struggle of a game. Flare or bust. This is it. Oh my goodness, Valley Rescuer, just uh, the Verge pathway off the top. That's it. Nine fairy tokens. Fire and Craig Pyromancer is coming in. Yeah, it's a fairy. That's going to be able to do uh, trigger both of these Pyromancers. They're going to both go to face. Sato is going to go down to one in his own end step. And then... Wow. It is academic from there for Ken Yukihira to push that last point of damage through. Mani, I cannot believe what we are seeing here. Sato scooping it up. Ken Yukihira, <laughs> the people's hero.